Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brent Riddle, and I'm the Senior Program Officer in the German Marshall Fund's Urban and Regional Policy Program. And I'm very happy to be able to welcome everyone here today to the very first in a series of webinars called Network to Network that the Urban and Regional Policy Program will be implementing going forward. Um, so we have today about 80 people registered for the webinar, so we're off to a great start. We're really excited about that. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about the webinar series. Um, and um, So the first thing I want to tell you is that the, the Network to Network webinar series is really envisioned as a sort of an uh, interactive series where we try to explore and encourage practitioner learning and, and ongoing dialogue. So as you know, today's webinar is uh, from Munich to Malmö, Lessons from Europe on Transit Priority and Livable Streets. Uh, and the webinar today will be focused on topics such as civic, civic engagement or placemaking or strategic partnerships or, or other topics. Um, <clears throat> the future webinars will be announced on the Urban Programs blog site, which is urbancurrent.org, which you can see on your screen there. So we invite you all to uh, continue to check out the Urban Policy Programs blog at the Urban Current and check out information on the latest in the webinar series. And please make sure and tell your friends or colleagues about Network to Network and uh, invite them to, to join us if they uh, find a topic that they like. Uh, just very quickly, I want to give you kind of an overview of the, the goal of the webinar series. So GMF and the Urban Programs uh, essential goal is, is really uh, a continuing mission to facilitate cooperation and the exchange of knowledge. And we do that by fostering dialogue among practitioners. And that's really sort of the bread and butter of what we've been doing over the past five and a half years, and really GMF for the last 40 years. Um, through the Network to Network webinar series, we, we really hope to introduce members of our network to new learning opportunities and new concepts. We also hope to facilitate peer learning and exchange around topics of interest to our network, uh, people that uh, we engage with on a regular basis and even people that we you know, are just now getting to know. Um, <clears throat> the webinar series is really envisioned as a place for uh, members of our network to present you know, projects or report out from fellowships or other research, which you'll see today, or solicit feedback and even start a debate. So we really hope that this is an interactive, um, vibrant space for people to participate. At the end of each webinar, uh, we invite you all uh, to, um, to share information, engage in dialogue, ask questions, and, and give us feedback. Um, that will be really important for us as we sort of continue to hone the, the webinar series going forward. Um, and we also invite you to provide feedback or suggestions for new topics. Uh, that would be great. You know, if, um, if you have a great topic that you think would be uh, a good fit, then please, please share. So now I'm going to turn the floor over to my car uh, colleague, Bartek Sardai. He's going to be introducing today's webinar and our very first guest speaker. So Bartek, it's yours. Thank you, Brent. Good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar hosted by the Urban and Regional Policy Program here at the German Marshall Fund. First, a few logistics. This webinar will be recorded and posted later this week on our website. Second, uh, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the questions pane and our two uh, presenters will get to them in the second half of the webinar. Both of our presenters are graduates of the Urban and Regional Fellowship Program. This fellowship program gives policymakers uh, the opportunity to uh, cross the Atlantic, basically, and uh, research policy issues uh, and challenges that are common to regions and cities in the United States and Europe. So they offer the opportunity for practitioners uh, to meet with their counterparts overseas. For more information on our fellowship program, uh, please visit gmfus.org. Uh, both of our presenters are, 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 as I mentioned, are graduates of this program and have also published policy briefs on their research, so you may find more information on their research uh, there. Today's topic is transportation, and we at the Urban Program have a considerable history of supporting research within this issue. But of course, transportation policy is also related to a host of other issues from the way we use our public sphere to how we prioritize and arrange the institutions that govern us. So you'll hear within these presentations, uh, both of our uh, presenters uh, focus their research on transportation, but of course, this also involves um, a host of other policy issues and areas. Our first presenter will be uh, 
Denver uh, Igarta. Uh, he is an urban planner for the Portland Bureau of Transportation. He completed his fellowship here at GMS in 2011 and recently published a policy brief on his issue, on his research. His work involves a broad range of uh, programs within Portland, including bicycle, pedestrian, and price planning efforts. And he's currently involved in many uh, transportation projects within the city. And with that, Denver, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you uh, to present on your research. OK, thank you very much, Bartek. Um, and yes, I am Denver Igarda. I am a transportation planner. And I've been with the city since 2006, when I was originally hired to work on the city's bicycle plan. I'm going to cover quite a lot of material and try and do it really quickly, most, mostly because I'm excited to hear what Tony has to present. Um, Yes, in 2011, November, I had the honor of taking a study tour as an urban regional policy fellow um, of four European cities. My focus of the, my research was on residential streets. Neighborhood streets occupy a significant outside where we live. The challenges we face as planners is how do we enable the streets uh, in neighborhoods to contribute more to the urban environment? I was really interested uh, during my travels to, to see how cities um, use tools to, mit to minimize traffic impacts and where um, they provided space for active living, walking and biking and playing, and, and also opportunities to, to interact between neighbors. In the US, streets typically serve one purpose, and that's to move cars. In Portland, two-thirds of, uh, right of public right-of-way is devoted to uh, moving and storing cars. Um, this typically fit forces people um, to the edge of the right-of-way. Um, I was curious to see how space uh, might be arranged to bring people into the street. In Europe, I was in search of livable streets. A livable street is a street that accommodates the diverse needs of the neighborhood, putting people, not cars, first. The month in Europe um, took me to four European cities um, in four different countries, starting with Munich in Germany. Rotterdam in the Netherlands, Copenhagen, Denmark, and finally to Malmo, Sweden. I chose these four cities not only due to their success in implementing measures to de-emphasize cars in neighborhoods, but also because they face intense pressure to accommodate the growth in traffic. And Munich um, is, a, is a city with a very strong driving culture. Rotterdam's home to one of the Mo the largest ports in the world. Copenhagen is seeing increase in car trips and car usage. And in Malmo, they're, they've experienced really rapid growth in population. I boiled my uh, countless observations and conversations down to three basic policy lessons. Um, first, to emphasize the staying function of streets. Second, to make bike, walking biking the easiest option. And third, to build streets at a human scale. Uh, the first lesson uh, is uh, sojourning, and this is what I call the, loss, the third lost function of streets. That's primarily because national guidelines in the U.S. define the functions of streets purely based on auto use. You can see the graph on the left from our AASHTO guideline, which shows um, emphasizing mobility functions on arterials and access functions on local streets. All four of the countries I visited account for the sojourning or staying function in how they design streets. This allows streets to go beyond just moving traffic and also invites people to come and stay, stop and stay a while. Two street design concepts shown on this slide um, come from Copenhagen. The first one, Talkscapes, is a public realm example. And it shows how you can arrange furniture to not only allow for people to gather, but also to encourage them to interact with one another. The second one on the right is an edge zone. And this is a private realm example, the transition between the home and the street which allows neighbors to, to comfortably interact with one another as well. This diagram comes from German national guidelines, and it shows a very practical process for designing one specific type of street, um, the, Von, the Vonstrasse, which is a quiet residential street. In Germany, they start by identifying whether to emphasize walking, biking, sojourning, or, or parking. And then they, they next look at whether it's a bu bus route um, what the traffic volumes are, and then finally what the right-of-way width is. 
based on that, they come up with five possible cross sections that might fit for that specific street. Um, all showing different options with without trees, parking on one side or both sides. And these um, options all fit within that specific street type. In the US, um, we the process starts really with um, looking at the needs of cars and often walking and biking is left with whatever space remains. In Portland, traditionally, we have one option for improving residential streets, and that's this one that's circled, the parking and trees on both sides. Um, I'll get to some examples of how we're, we're trying to expand those options here in Portland in a minute. The second lesson has to do with creating conditions where walking, biking are the smartest way to get around. All of uh, bicycling and pedestrian mode share over 40% of trips, and in Rotterdam, it's uh, half of trips. Portland, by contrast, um, has about 12% of commute trips by walking and biking. We have a target to reach 32% by 2030. So to achieve this, we'll need to look to the European cities as examples. The, the lesson that I, I discovered there was to make the mode you want people to choose the easiest option. The graphic on the left is from Copenhagen. It shows how policy there's a policy to make sustainable modes more direct. And the photo on the right is from Malmo, and it shows a quiet residential street where pedestrians and bikes have uh, access but not cars. Um, this not only makes the trip shorter for walking and biking, but it also re re reduces the interaction with cars um, for those users. The final lesson is right-sizing streets by design for people to enable them to use the street outside their car. The width of the roadway plays a critical part in the speed of traffic. Um, Design can give cues to drivers to, to know how fast they should be traveling and what other users to expect in the roadway. Proper design can create what I call a human pace or streets that are calm to the speed of human-powered modes, walking or biking. Um, the bicycle pace um, that I'll be referring to is the 30 kilometer per hour or 20 mile per hour streets. Um, this is a very comfortable bicycle pace. These um, there are examples in Munich and Rotterdam and Copenhagen of these types of streets. Um, the walking pace street, the, all four cities um, have a walking pace street that's less than uh, 10 miles per hour or 15 kilometers per hour. This is very comfortable for walking uh, alongside cars. Walking pace streets give pedestrians the right to use the full width of the roadway and often allow kids to play in the roadway. Uh, the most common example is the, the, the Von Erf in the Netherlands, and you can see there's no sidewalk on these photos from Germany. Um, this street uh, in the cities that I visited has um, limited application. It's more sporadic in how it's used. The bicycle pace street, on the other hand, which is a 30 kilometer per hour speed or 20 mile per hour speed, um, is used very frequently throughout residential areas in um, um, most of the cities I visited. Um, Munich and Rob Rotterdam are particular examples where they apply 30 km per hour speeds to the entire district. They start by identifying the primary routes. Um, the ones in Rotterdam on the top right are shown in red. And then they, um, they assign those 50 km per hour, and then they assign all the other streets in between 30 km or 20 miles per hour. In Munich, these types of streets make up 80% of the streets in the city. On quiet, low-traffic residential streets, I was also curious to learn about how social aspects of streets are, that serve people um, when they're designed properly. Each city I, uh, in each city I visited, I picked one street uh, with the qualities of a livable street. Um, in addition to collecting photos and dimensions, I conducted a survey along the street. Uh, the first question that I asked, or one of the questions I asked was, what do you like most about your street? Um, many of the responses had to do with the social aspect of the street. Um, the most frequent response was that they just liked their neighbors. 68% um, of those who responded talked to their neighbors at least weekly. So that's another clue at how important that is to their, um, their quality of life. So just to conclude, I'm going to highlight just the Portland. Um, Projects, these projects are examples of how um, we've been exploring the potential to expand the role of streets. The first one is a, a, a local street plan for the Cully neighborhood, which in this slide is shown in the yellow outline, suffers from poor connectivity. This is a map of the sidewalk network. 
um, which shows um, how um, uh, incomplete it is. Um, only a third of streets in this, this neighborhood have sidewalks or a sidewalk. And there are 50 blocks of unimproved uh, gravel streets, as you can see. They look um, like this one in the photo. We asked the community what, it, what improvements they wanted to see. And we also asked them what are the things they like about their street that they want to preserve if improvements are made. And quite surprised about the number of benefits that they identified of unpaved and narrow paved streets, um, including um, most significantly the, the um, calm traffic slow speeds of traffic, um, but also mature trees, um, space for gardening and just gathering, as you can see on the bottom right. Uh, so we came up with uh, several street options um, that minimize the footprint of the roadway, um, were traffic calm by design. They reduce the loss of um, ex existing canopy, tree canopy, and offered some space for gathering. The street options that came out of Cully fed directly into the second project, which is the citywide street by street project, um, where we worked with our engineers and project managers and permitting staff to identify new standards for local uh, quiet residential streets. Um, this is one of the options. It's the shared street. It's shown in this slide. Um, it's the first time we've divine, defined the conditions where it's suitable to allow peds, and bi peds bikes, and cars to share the same space. Um, it's a narrow traffic street with uh, less than 500 cars per day. The last project I wanted to highlight is the city's comprehensive plan. The city's in the process of updating its long-range 20-year plan for growth and development, and this is the first time we've done that since 1980. New draft policies include um, 5.27, which says to consider both the place and transportation functions when designing each street. Um, we also are looking at policies to um, allow use of the right-of-way for common space and gathering, and for creation of context-sensitive streets through flexible design standards. Finally, just reflecting on the fellowship, um, the, trip the trip for me proved very invaluable in helping me to understand how Euro European cities have moved beyond just uh, streets for, for the single purpose of transportation. Um, I was able to learn about the historic evolution of strategies to uh, mitigate traffic impacts in neighborhoods it's also able to observe how culture um, plays a role in um, uh, how these different uh, approaches are, are taken in different cities, different countries. And then also, finally, uh, is able to interact um, and inquire directly with local experts on the state of practice in their city. And this helped me to also establish a network of experts um, for future questions and inquiries. So I want to thank you for allowing me to share the lessons that I learned during my fellowship. And um, in addition to the policy brief, I also kept a pretty extensive travel blog, which is on the top right-hand corner, um, if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Denver. Thank you, Denver. And with that, uh, thank you, Denver. And uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, um, regarding Denver's presentation or anything you would like to ask him, um, feel free to send uh, questions using the questions pane. With that, we'll move on to our next presenter, Tony Mazzella. He is the strategic uh, he's a, a strategic advisor for the Seattle Department of Transportation. His fellowship uh, occurred during the last fall of 2012, and he just recently published his policy brief as a result of uh, his research. As the strategic advisor for the Seattle uh, Department of Transportation, he manages many long-range and comprehensive transportation planning processes. Um, and so he used his fellowship to go to Munich and Zurich to study the not only the transportation infrastructure that those cities have, but also the, infrastructure, the institutions that govern uh, that infrastructure. Uh, so with that, Tony, I'll, I'll hand it over to you uh, to briefly present on your fellowship research. And we're just waiting for Tony to get set up on his end.
We're having um, the proverbial technical difficulties here, so if you would just bear with me for hopefully just one or two minutes. Not a problem. Thank you, Tony. I will also say while we're waiting for Tony that in addition to uh, publishing uh, uh, policy briefs from their research, uh, we, we have the fellows keep uh, blogs of their research while they're out in the field. So this allows them to capture their research and also disseminate it to a wider audience. And all of this can be found on our blog, which is urbancurrent.org. Looks like we've solved our technical problems and are ready. <clears throat> Great, Tony. Why don't you get started? Um, thank you all for uh, including me in this webinar and um, allowing me to share my impressions of the German Marshall Fund Fellowship and um, some of the lessons learned from both Munich and Zurich. Um, trying to now get the second slide, which is causing a difficulty. OK. So um, let me just start off with a uh, very basic overview of my presentation. I'll talk a little about uh, my research question that I wanted to investigate uh, in Europe and my motivation for um, applying for the fellowship. I'll describe the features of both Munich and Zurich uh, and their transit systems and what makes transit so successful in these cities. And then um, I'll conclude by uh, talking briefly about lessons learned for uh, my city of Seattle. And when I refer to Seattle, uh, I'll really be talking about the, uh, the several transit agencies within um, my region. Um, my motivation for applying for the fellowship was because I found myself uh, very uniquely poised to investigate uh, what makes uh, urban public transit a success. Uh, I was serving as the project manager for the Seattle Transit Master Plan, and um, that certainly acquainted me with a whole range of issues related to high quality public transit and how we could make uh, transit work much better in our city and our region. And I've continued my involvement in transit planning. Um, right now, I'm managing a project that is looking at the um, implementation of a new streetcar line in downtown Seattle. Um, my methods were fairly straightforward. Uh, I was blessed with the fact that all of the transportation professionals and others I came in contact to in both cities were quite fluent in English. Um, Munich and Zurich consistently rank within the top five cities uh, in the Western world in terms of livability and the quality of their transportation systems. And um, I was very uh, interested in using their transit systems as someone who was a complete outsider and not uh, familiar with the language because how an outsider acclimates themselves and utilizes a transit system is in my estimation one of the uh, benchmark measures of how successful that system is. Um, as you can see, uh, Munich is roughly twice the size of Seattle in terms of population, Zurich about half the size. Both cities are considerably more dense uh, than Seattle, and we know density affects ridership um, heavily. But 
I think Seattle is growing in such a way that it is um, it's a, beginning to achieve the densities needed to support very high quality transit. Uh, both cities enjoy an extensive network of surface tram and uh, bus service. And um, Munich, uh, shown um, the picture on your left, uh, has a very extensive underground or U-Bahn system. Both cities uh, have also, uh, or are served by commuter rail. Uh, the picture on your right shows the, uh, the Zurich uh, commuter rail system or um, a station, a major station there. Um, but within the center of these cities, these commuter rail lines do run underground primarily. And so, in fact, while Zurich doesn't have a formal U-Bahn, it, it actually has a, a functioning subway system. Um, this is a map of the Munich transit system involving their commuter line, the S-Bahn, underground U-Bahn, the tram system, and their metro bus system, which are essentially their uh, priority bus corridors. You can see just from this schematic how dense the system is. And it offers multiple options to get almost anywhere um, that you'd want to travel to in each city. Frequency and reliability are two of the most common um, measurements of transit quality. And as you can see in this photo, there's real-time information uh, at the subway uh, station. And in fact, that technology is uh, very common on trams and buses in both cities. Uh, in Zurich, to give you a, an example of uh, frequent service, trams run about every seven and a half minutes from five in the morning until 12.30 in the morning. And the Munich Underground comes at 10 minute intervals and runs uh, approximately from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. the following day. Uh, both cities, in comparison to Seattle, for example, enjoy superb mode share. Uh, you'll notice that uh, what one thing that differentiates Munich and Zurich is that Munich has a much higher uh, biking mode share, and we can talk about that later in the Q&A. Um, also, from a point of comparison, Zurich averages, Zurich averages about 560 transit trips per person per year. Uh, in comparison, Seattle and the King County area uh, average about 58 uh, transit trips per person per year. So Zurich has one of the highest per capita transit uses of any city in the world. The reasons these uh, cities are so successful um, come down to a number of policy and technical uh, issues. Both cities have long histories of uh, clear policy direction that establishes public transit as essential for what they call sustainable growth. Both cities enjoy uh, dedicated public funding, both from taxes and, relatively speaking, modest government subsidies. And both uh, systems uh, achieve incredibly efficient uh, operating uh, efficiencies. Uh, for example, uh, in Germany, about 78% uh, of operating revenues come from fare box recovery. In the United States, typically that's closer to about 33%. Um, the right of first approach is really a combination of a philosophical orientation and a set of tools that attempt to remove or reduce all obstacles to riding transit. Uh, both cities are are influenced by these regional transit authorities, which have developed integrated regional fare and ticketing systems for all transit operators within the region and with all modes. Uh, the photo on your left shows a ticket machine in Zurich. There are approximately 2,000 of these machines placed at stations, post office, uh, at the regional and national rail service stations. And from these machines, you can get a, a ticket that will take you anywhere within the canton of Zurich uh, and beyond and um, require only uh, 
a sort of a one-stop shop. On your right, you see a map of the canton of Zurich. Zurich is in the Zurich itself is in the lower left white area, and um, this integrating agency offers an array of fair instruments uh, designed to meet the particular needs of just about everyone, from tourists to frequent customers. Um, both cities enjoy transit priority programs for uninterrupted travel between stations, um, offering maximum priority for public transit vehicles at all intersections controlled by traffic signals. In fact, in both cities, transit priority, its greatest challenge is that you have so many cross streets where transit is operating that the question becomes which transit gets the priority at an intersection. Um, these are two photos from Munich. On the left, the mayor is addressing a sustainability conference that's held on an annual basis in which the city's message around sustainable uh, urban development and public transit is uh, reinforced. On the right is, the photo, is a photo of the cover page of a booklet called My New City, which is mailed out uh, to every new resident of Munich on an annual basis. And this uh, manual describes an entire array of uh, city benefits, amenities, and sustainable practices from energy conservation to bicycling to public transit. Um, both cities have put in place a number of, of infrastructure and programmatic supports for transit. Bicycle parking in both cities uh, at key stations is uh, widespread, and the photo on your right shows a newly developing neighborhood in Zurich served by a new tram line. This is a former industrial quarter which is now becoming much more mixed use and office, and uh, the densities there will be higher than uh, the city as a whole. First steps to replicate much of what I saw in Munich and Zurich. On the left, we see what's known as a queue jump. The bus is uh, getting a signal to be able to enable it to cross the intersection before the general purpose traffic. On the right, you see what we call a curb bulb, which is an extended pedestrian waiting zone, uh, which allows the bus to stop in lane, not having to pull to the curb and then away from the curb, which uh, creates a lot of delay issues, and it offers a comfortable and spacious area for the pedestrians, uh, passengers to wait. Um, essentially, the Seattle needs to do a number of things or continue to do a number of things to achieve high quality transit. Uh, public education campaigns that continually reinforce the message around the relationship between sustainable growth and public transit. Um, we need to consistently apply aggressive transit priority measures, especially on our most highly productive uh, rail and uh, bus routes. Agencies within my region need to work together to, again, uh, develop and sustain this uh, rider-first approach and um, in continued investments need to be made in pedestrian facilities to get people to and from transit, parking management so that parking, uh, on-street parking doesn't detract from transit priority, the, de the density and land use changes, especially around our major stations that actually As Denver said, you know, the, the fellowship supported a number of um, great opportunities. Uh, just to see how professionals like myself struggled with many of the same issues regardless of our uh, countries and cultures. Uh, both cities were very impressive in terms of the way they integrated their technical uh, features and improvements with policy and public messaging. Um, critical that while agency complexity is real, uh, that that complexity never detract from the customer experience. And again, as Denver mentioned earlier, um, 
by being able to speak to your counterparts in a very personalized uh, fashion, you not only learn about what they're doing, but you learn a lot about the history and the cultural underpinning for the particular policy making transit work so well. So with that, uh, I'll end my presentation and uh, turn, it up, turn it over to Q&A. Thank you, Denver. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Tony, for that uh, great presentation. And with that, we have a number of questions coming in, and please do send those questions in using the the questions pane. I'll start it off with uh, one question that we received, and that gets to a bit, a little bit of the implementation of your research, and that is, where is where do you think our, the leverage is in uh, each of your cities and each of your agencies, in terms of, you know, beginning to move away from uh, the concept of a street as being car-centric to one more of a shared space. Um, so, you know, for, for Denver, the linkage to your research of that question is pretty obvious in terms of what is the role of, of a public street running through a neighborhood. And it also is relevant for you, Tony, as far as, you know, if we're going to have uh, transit that, that all uh, very much impacts other other travel modes. So where is the leverage? Uh, how do we begin to move to you know, a conception of the street of shared space? Is it necessary to move to this conception? What are your thoughts? Uh, Denver, maybe you could start first? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that question. Um, in Portland, uh, we've, we've kind of had something of an evolution in how we think of uh, the function of streets in that it's always been really the the purview of the Transportation Bureau as kind of keepers of the right-of-way to make sure that uh, it's serving its transportation function efficiently. Um, and we've always had utilities within the right-of-way, which is one other function. But where we've seen the most change in the last five years has been related to how we uh, manage and treat stormwater within the roadway. Um, our Stormwater Management Manual requires that all um, that stormwater, it, 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 as much as possible, that it's treated um, at the source, which means most of our streets that are being built are being built as green streets with a swale um, and um, green features. Um, so we've we've been um, uh, working through that across bureaus for some time now. And, and I think at the same time, we're realizing that our kind of one-size-fits-all approach to streets, you know, fitting a specific standard, doesn't work um, across the city that well. So I think what we've, what we've started to realize, and I think what's coming out of our, our policy update and citywide is that it makes much more sense for us to work across bureaus and to, and to work with the community to really identify the, the, um, the desires and functions of streets and tailor them to each community. Should I give this a try? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And Tony, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, in, in Seattle's case, is it, uh, you know, is it from the regulatory perspective? Is it about public engagement? Um, where, is, where, is, where do you see your leverage as, as being? On the policy implementation, and the public messaging levels. We've clearly demonstrated through our transit master plan and actually other planning documents that it will literally be impossible for Seattle to meet its growth targets over the next 20 years and manage that growth and maintain economic competitiveness, particularly in our center city downtown area, by relying on single occupancy vehicles. We need and have clearly articulated that those future needs in particular must be met by moving more and more people by public transit. We, and actually I found this quite um, similar to the struggle that my counterparts in Europe are facing. The street width 
is a fixed geometry, so to speak, and um, creating space for the non-single occupancy vehicle modes is a struggle for all of us. We certainly have, through a number of mechanisms, both at the policy and also at the implementation stage, have made great strides in accommodating other modes, atypical modes, unfortunately. Uh, I have to, in some ways, call them walking and biking and transit in um, all of our major street projects. So we really scrutinize our capital projects from a complete streets perspective. And on streets that uh, we've identified in our master plan as being priority bus or rail corridors, we essentially have prioritized that mode within those corridors. Um, so there is a, a revolution going on in quite a few U.S. cities around the use of street space, and more and more that street space is being given over to transit, walking, biking. Thanks, Thanks Tony. Uh, there's another question coming in which specifically towards the city of, city of Portland, but also I think uh, this also of course implicates the city of Seattle as well, which is what is the view of the compatibility of the shared space model with U.S. national standards such as Ashoto? Um, what is, so how do you sort of um, go between the two, Denver, mm -hmm. which is of course what you would like to do within the city of Portland, but also, you know, you're also working within, you know, larger policy frameworks and standards. Right. So, yeah, the, it is a challenge. Uh, I think um, it's also, um, I think the, uh, the way that we've managed to implement shared streets in Portland, we actually have a few, and they've been um, primarily in our central city area. Um, and so we have designed them, and I think that one of the biggest challenges is uh, for us is to ensure that it's, uh, it meets the American with Disability Act requirements in terms of uh, um, uh, it being accessible. And what we've done is uh, we've uh, worked within uh, the, the national guidelines to, um, to really uh, define you know, the conditions in terms of speed, in terms of dimensions of the roadway, in terms of traffic volumes, um, to, uh, to say that uh, a, a the reality that we have here in Portland is we have um, a large very large number uh, of streets throughout the city that lack sidewalks, and especially on our local residential streets. Um, so the conditions out there are often um, a shared environment already. Um, the problem is that often those streets are, are way too wide, and uh, as a result, there's high speeds of traffic they are used for cut through. And so what we've tried to do is to, to really provide some clarity on how we can keep the, the, really the speeds and volumes of traffic um, to a minimum. Um, and there are a lot of streets out across the city that are really purely for um, local access. In the Cully neighborhood, um, we found that over 70 percent of streets had less than 500 cars a day, which means really they're just being used for local access to, to properties. And that translates to about less than a car a minute during the busiest time of the day. So uh, when we talk about it in those terms, um, we are able to um, to relate uh, within the community with kind of the conditions that are, are out there and also, you know, we're able to work with our engineers to define how it meets national guidelines. Denver, can, can a cost savings argument also be made regarding the shared shared space model? Um, you know, is there, can you input the, the question of money? Um, Absolutely, because, <laughs> because um, it was the primary question we were trying to address in the Cully neighborhood, which is um, a modest income area. And uh, local streets in Portland are the responsibility uh, for maintenance of the property owners until they're brought up to standard. And it's the requirement 
of the property owner to, to pay for that initial improvement. Um, and originally, our, our one-size-fits-all kind of standard was about $1,500 um, dollar, dollars per linear foot. And we were able to essentially identify the shared street as being about 30% of that original cost. And so for us to get any improvement at all, um, we needed to adopt a standard where um, the, the improvements were not only um, uh, lowest uh, cost possible, but also produced the kind of conditions that we wanted to foster the, um, you know, the activities on the street that we want. The one thing that was really amazing is that um, in the Cully neighborhood, lots of people love to walk and, and also um, gather in gravel streets and on uh, low traffic, uh, narrow streets. Um, a lot of these streets have like really big trees and gardens and all kinds of features like basketball hoops. And um, you know, people are using the streets um, in an active way because uh, the way that they've uh, the way that they're functioning, and so we want to preserve that, and and also, um, you know, it helps that the the cost of these options, these new options, are, are significantly less. There's a, a very interesting question out, which is a bit specific, but I think it's um, something that we observe a lot in in U.S. cities, which is the question of emergency management um, and emergency vehicles um, and the right of ways that you know large fire trucks. Uh, should have even on on small residential streets, and that's often used as an argument um, against um, you know small shared uh, streets and often transit as well. Did you find uh, that the the view of emergency management and emergency management vehicles um, that is viewed differently in Europe? Uh, what is the role of that, um, Denver or Tony? Um, did that come up at all uh, within your European research? Well, I, that was the first question I asked almost. To, it, the first time I was able to sit down with an engineer in each city, I asked that question because, honestly, that's the biggest challenge that we face. Um, and, you know, I think the simple answer is that they have a um, different equipment that they use uh, in the European cities, um, that they don't necessarily um, design every street to fit the very largest of, uh, emergency vehicle. And in, in Portland, we've actually worked with very closely with our fire bureau to start to uh, look at these new options and to get um, their input early on about what their requirements are. And again, you know, often if you're starting with a gravel street, you can really improve access, emergency access for, for fire and police uh, by just making some basic improvements. And what we've learned is you know, our standard has always been about 20 feet of clear space um, within the roadway is what they need to set up their outriggers for their uh, ladder trucks. Um, but they don't necessarily need it continuously throughout the whole block, that if they can have it um, consistently in locations where they, they can set up close to where a fire occurs, then it, provide, it meets their needs. So that's one of the things we've been working closely with our fire bureau to start to work through. And the standards that we've identified have been um, with the approval of our fire bureau. And Tony, has, did it come up at all within your research? Well, I would just add uh, a bit to what uh, Denver had said. Uh, the equipment size in the European cities that I was in is quite different. Smaller vehicles, uh, accessing narrower streets. Let me just um, say something about another source of very large vehicles, which is freight. And uh, that particularly concerned me because in the city of Seattle, um, we negotiate um, with our freight community around the functionality of, of certain streets. Um, we have a large port and freight access and movements are important to us. What I saw in Europe, though, was that um, these two cities of Munich and Zurich had developed a, a freight kind of distribution si system that uh, essentially relegated very large trucks to peripheral locations and then goods were broken down and delivered into um, 
the denser parts of, of each city. Uh, they were more strict with hours of delivery. Um, and yet, uh, clearly, and especially in Zurich, this is a very affluent city. I, I saw no evidence that goods were not getting to the smallest store in the most dense section of the city. So I, I think that um, there are lessons to be learned uh, in terms of how to maintain freight access and delivery, even if you have a, a, a great generator like the Port of Seattle, and at the same time allow streets to function for residents and visitors alike, which are not uh, designed for the uh, largest vehicle that possibly might use that street. And we just have a few minutes left, uh, and I just have one more question for both Denver and Tony. And I'd like to, uh, you know, imagine um, I'm a European a transit official and I have an American transit official coming to my office and asking me a bunch of questions about transit policy. So I'm wondering what the reception was um, for both of you in Europe as far as um, did they think it was strange that you were coming over there? Um, what were their thoughts on uh, what they thought America could learn um, from each of their cities and from each of their agencies? What are your general thoughts on reception uh, that you've had over in Europe? Tony, maybe you could um, answer this question first. Well, um, I was completely uh, welcomed by everyone who I met. And uh, for the most part, uh, these were individuals who had actually been to the United States, uh, visiting different cities, uh, attending different conferences. They had, generally speaking, quite a lot of contact with their U.S. counterparts, and they were uh, more than willing to share uh, both their successes and what they thought were their greatest challenges. Uh, in fact, one of the questions that was asked to me by both transportation professionals in, in each city was really how they could learn from what we in the United States called impact fees, in which we charge new development a certain fee to be able to support the infrastructure, and often that infrastructure includes transit, to manage that growth. So while I was totally blown away and impressed by the quality of their transportation or transit systems, uh, they themselves had some questions for me, which reflected their frustration as to some of the limitations that they worked under. So I, I think that kind of dialogue really, um, really even the playing field, so to speak, and um, made us all uh, reflect upon how much more we have in common on a day-to-day -day working uh, basis than um, we have um, as differences uh, among us. And Denver, did you have a similar yeah, experience? Um, I think one of the things that uh, was, you know, quite uh, clear is that much like here in the states, um, where cities are competing against one another to try and uh, develop reputations for sustainable mobility, in Europe there is also that, um, you know desire to, sh to spread the news about the good things that they're doing in these different cities. So I was definitely welcomed in each city that I went to. And I think in particular there was a lot of interest um, from each of the cities in talking about the uh, side of transportation in each of these cities. And so um, I was pretty much shocked when I was invited to um, give a presentation on bicycling in Portland to Copenhagen's bicycle program staff and walked into the, the meeting um, feeling very inadequate um, uh, given you know how much the work there is to be done in Portland but what I learned through that was you know the question I was questions I was getting you know that we did have uh, in, in the states and in Portland we do have 
lessons to share, and I've uh, been very grateful that um, three of the um, experts that are I met in Europe have now come to Portland to to see what we have done here in terms of uh, uh, walking and biking and transit and sustainability. And so um, I think uh, there's definitely a strong value for um, exchanging lessons learned and be best practices and, and a recognition that no matter how far you get along the path, there's still more to be learned. Absolutely. And in fact, um, what Denver is referring to, you know, we've, we certainly try and promote cross-exchange. So not only funding um, folks from North America to go to Europe, but also uh, returning that the other way, um, funding practitioners from Europe to go to the United States, and there's certainly something um, that they can learn as well. Um, that's something definitely that we found uh, with, our ex with our experience with the fellowship program. And with that, I'd like to thank Denver and Tony for their presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you. For more information uh, on the fellowship program, uh, feel free to visit our webpage or send a message to myself and Brent. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending and for submitting questions as well. If you have any questions to either Denver or Tony, uh, feel free to message uh, either Brent or myself and we will put you in touch with one of them. And with that, thank you very much. Thanks Tony and Denver. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.